I'm Jasmine Moradi, and you're listening to the Queens of Tech podcast, a podcast series about raising the voice of workplace champions. 60 plus questions in around 30 to 40 minutes with women, women of color, non-binary, and transgender influencers about their journey into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I started the Queens of Tech podcast initiative in May 2022 because I would like to retain more women, women of color, non-binary, and transgenders in the tech industry. Talent is out there, but our work environment needs to improve for all to feel safer, stay authentic, and to be valued for our contributions. My vision is to raise the workplace ecosystem for all in tech by killing the imposter syndrome, stopping bad behavior, and increasing equity opportunities. Each podcast talk is built around 60 plus questions regarding upbringing, education, career path, DIB, and future advice. My mission is to bridge a gap between schools and workplaces by getting into the heart of my guest's personal life and career journey to inspire other girls, women, women of color, non-binary, and transgenders to unleash the full potential to reach top leadership roles in the tech industry. My goal is to raise the voices of tech champions around the world and together with companies, investors, and politicians raise the challenges and opportunities around equity, inclusive, diversity, and belonging in our workplaces. Enough is enough. I would like to enforce companies to build a sustainable, inclusive culture to retain diverse talent so we keep the workforce power equity to continue building future diverse and inclusive products. Representation matters. Your voice matters. In this episode, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Tech Queen Melissa Slauso, General Counsel, VP of Government Affairs and Education at GeoLink. Hi, Melissa. I'm very happy to have you joining us all the way from U.S., California. How are you? Hello. It is morning here, so good morning from California. Good evening where you are. Yes. How are you today? Doing well today. I have my coffee, so I'm good. I'm ready. Perfect. I'm so happy. So now let us dig deep into your journey into STEM. Hope you're ready for the Queens of Tech 60 plus questions. I'm ready. Let's warm up with a few fun facts about you. How would you describe your personality in three hashtags? We'll see how these translate to a non-U.S. audience. So first of all, the first hashtag is the velvet hammer. And this is something that my a former boss used to call me because I come in and I'm soft and I'm sweet and I'm fuzzy and warm. But then if you piss me off, I'm not. So she used to call me her velvet hammer. And then the second one is a hashtag I gave myself when I first started being in-house counsel for my first company that I was a general counsel for is as soon as you're the lawyer for a company, people come to you and they start asking you, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I do this? What about this? And the goal is not to say no all the time, but unfortunately people come up with some crazy stuff and you have to say no and you try to do it gently, but it is what it is. So I gave myself the hashtag crusher of dreams. There are often times where I decided to say, no, bro, I'm sorry, you can't do that. And then the last one I actually thought about this morning because I couldn't come up with the third one. And I don't know if there are similar commercials where you are, but in the U.S. there are these insurance commercials where they joke about you're turning into your parents. And it's because you do silly things like talk to the produce guy at the grocery store. And it's like the produce guy doesn't need to know your name. But, you know, and you can kind of picture like your dad doing that, right? When you go to the grocery store. Well, I like to talk to the cashier at the fabric store, for example, or I like to say hello to the fellow Mach-E driver at the car charging station. And my friend made a lot of fun of me this weekend. And I'm like, whatever. I like to talk to strangers. And she's like, you are definitely turning into your parents. So I'm hashtag turning into your parents. How would you describe your life in three sentences or hashtags? They're not really either. I'm breaking the rules here. They're kind of just phrases. Um, so to cool nerd, because when I was a kid, who oh boy, has a nerd. Um, I was not cool. Everyone made fun of me. But now I'm a cool nerd. I'm still a nerd. Let's be very clear. 
And then the second one is the path less taken. And I think that's really indicative of my career path because when I came out of college, I didn't go straight to grad school, which was law school for me. I worked at a radio station and I worked at a local advertising agency in Tucson, Arizona, where I'm from. And then finally I got my act together and went to law school. And then when I got out of law school, I didn't follow the traditional path of going straight to a law firm. I went to a state agency and my first job because there were no jobs at the end of like mid 2007 to the beginning of 2008, because that's when the housing market crash happened here in the U.S. And the economy was crap. And everyone's like, we're not hiring anybody. Good luck to you. So I needed a job. So I found a, a non-legal analyst job, which was in the telecommunications field, but something that would at least get my foot in the door before I could get a legal job. So path less taken is how I would describe my path to getting where I am now. And then the last one is unapologetic acceptance, which is something that I have come to now that I'm in my 40s and I've gone to therapy, which everyone needs therapy. So go to therapy, everybody. Um, unapologetic acceptance, coming to terms with who I am and what I am and what I've seen and what I've done and being good with it. What kind of music stimulates and motivates you the most? I like a lot of different things. My music preferences change with my mood. I pretty much like anything that I can move around to or sing at the top of my lungs in my car. I used to sing in my shower, but now that I'm married and live with another human, I don't tend to do that. I'm actually not a bad singer, but for some reason I'm like, oh, there's another person in my space. I won't scream at the top of my lungs in the shower. Um, I was born in 1980s, so I levitate towards like early 90s and early 2000 alternatives because that was like formative years, you know, high school and college years. And I worked at an alternative rock radio station. So that radio station I mentioned, that's where I worked. So it's like my core music. But I'm currently loving all things Dua Lipa, big fan. But I'll jam it to some 90s country, little 90s hip hop, classic rock, anytime Journey comes on. But I'm always on the hunt for my next karaoke song. What's your personal motto? It's wherever you go, there you are. If you look into that statement a little bit more, I take its meaning to be pretty deep because wherever you are in the world, no matter who you meet, what job you're doing, whatever you're seeing or feeling, it's still you. That's a constant. It's your center, you know, and if things are hard or weird, you can fall back on knowing who you are, what your core is, what your morals are, what your center is, and you can use that to move forward. You should be true to yourself and your beliefs and your values, no matter how the world around you changes. And I strive to be me at all times. There's obviously professional me and silly me and, you know, different versions of me. But for the most part, Melissa is who you're going to get. And so that's why I stick to wherever you go, there you are. And what is your favorite book? This, this is going to be a controversial topic. I would like all your listeners to know that while I can read, I don't read. I read a lot for work. So in my leisure time, I am just not a reader. But I also am not a person of favorites. Favorites are not a thing. I don't have a favorite song. I don't have a favorite movie. I don't have a favorite food. I mean, I, I suppose I'm a married person, so I should say my favorite person is my husband. That's, uh, yeah, that's up to for me. But I do like an audio book. I like for the author to read me their book. I especially like when comedians read their own autobiographies because I really like comedy. I really like stand-up comedy. And so those are my favorite. I really dislike fiction novels because it's just too many details. I don't care how the rain glistened off of her alabaster skin in the autumn moonlight. And then there's a vampire. I don't care. I don't care about any of that. Just tell me a story. But the next one will be, what is your favorite podcast? This one might be controversial for you too, because since I don't commute for work anymore, so I've been working at home since 2014. So way before it was cool, way before COVID sent everybody home. So when I did commute for work, it was before podcasts were even really a thing. That's probably not true, but they were as popular as they are now because it was back in, I would say, 2017. So there was a period of time where I was commuting up to L.A. from the San Diego area via train well, at least once a week. So that was a solid three hours each way on the train. It was my audiobook time of my life. So I don't have a go-to podcast. I will admit that to the group. So if you have any suggestions, I'm always open. I do listen to Armchair Expert every so often. I don't know if that's a controversial answer. Mac or PC? Oh, God, I'm so lame. I'm a PC person. I'm an Android person. Yes, I am the green bubble in your group chat. 
Say something interesting about you that most people don't know. I do improv in my spare time. I do performances. I'm currently between teams. I had a team that we were on for five years and there was no drama or anything. We just recently broke up because people wanted to pursue other things. And my next step is I want to take a stand-up comedy class because I love performing and I love making people laugh. And what is your hidden talent? I am a singer and I love karaoke. And I used to be a band and my best friend wants me to do that again, but I don't really like late nights anymore, so. So you are a fun lawyer. I am a fun lawyer. Maybe that should be one of my hashtags. And if you were going to write a book about your life, what would a title be? Okay, this one made me giggle as I was thinking about the answer. So I haven't come up with the title for my book based on my current life. But when I was in my 20s and I was getting my psychology degree in college and considering psychology grad school, I would joke about writing a book called This is Therapeutic. And I know your podcast listeners can't see me, but I know you can see me. And I would be on the cover like this, like, this is therapeutic. Like, this is my face. But you're laughing. I'm glad you're laughing. And basically, the premise of the book is I would encourage couples to throw foam objects at each other. And of course, that would be a supervised activity. But I had this vision for me, like doing that on the picture, like this is therapeutic. And like they'd throw things at each other. And that was my book idea. But I think it was like 40 percent a joke and 60 percent serious. And I actually that's probably I stand by it. I think if people could just throw phone things at each other, probably it would solve a lot of problems. Now, let us dig deeper. Our child has an effect on our adulthood. Our early experiences shape our belief about ourselves, others and the world. So I want to discover your childhood. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, where it is very, very hot. What was your dream job as a child? You're going to love this. So I think I was like five or six. I wanted to be a ballerina whale trainer. I will let you visualize what you think that job is exactly. But I have a feeling I was taking dance lessons as, you know, most little girls growing up in like middle, upper middle class neighborhoods do. And when you take the dance lessons, you take like a group of classes. Ballet was one of them probably. And of course, living in Arizona, you're right next to San Diego. You can drive there. And SeaWorld was like the coolest in the 80s. So I'm thinking my little girl brain like combined those two things. And I was like, yes, ballerina whale trainer. And that's what I came up with. You don't have any favorites, but what was your favorite subject in school? Probably as I got older, my favorite was like choir and theater. But I was always good in math. I would never say that was my favorite, but I was always good in math going through school until senior year where I lost interest when I took calculus. And then it was boring and I didn't like it anymore. What was your least favorite subject? Oh, geometry, actually. Um, Something about it. So give me algebra all day long. So algebra, I aced, no problem. But something about geometry, and actually this brought up a lot of like childhood trauma because despite like legitimately trying in geometry, for some reason, I had a lot of difficulty writing out the things that you were supposed to write out in the correct order to explain the problem. I don't know why I couldn't figure it out. I think I put them in the wrong order all the time. It was my first C I ever got. But then next semester, Algebra 2, A. Trigonometry, A. Geometry, not my thing. And what was your earliest memory of technology and the arrival of the internet? So my dad was an engineer for IBM. So I don't know that we were on the cutting edge of technology, but we always had it in the house because my dad always had access to it. Um, so we had AOL dial-up starting when I was like 12. I mean, we had internet in the house early. I had email early. I remember playing very, very basic DOS-based computer games. I remember chatting with strangers in online chat rooms when I was really young. I never got a creepy feel for it, so I feel like the creepy came later, or somehow I avoided it. I don't know. So which were the three first technology gathers you owned yourself? Yes. Okay, so my parents were very early adopters of the cell phone. We didn't have the brick, but my mom got me an AT&T Go phone, I think is what it was called, when I first started driving. I had a cell phone when I was 16, which no one had a cell phone when they were 16 in the 90s. That was pretty cool. However, I don't even know if it had 50 minutes. It may have had like 25 minutes. It was strictly for emergencies. And I think it's because we had moved to Colorado for a couple of years and we lived 
pretty far away from things. And my mom was very freaked out about the concept of me driving on like country roads in the dark by myself. And so it lived in my glove box. It was off all this time and it was strictly for emergencies. But the point is I had a cell phone. No one else, literally no one else I knew had a cell phone. Um, in high school, I had a pager, not because I was a drug dealer, but because it was the coolest and everybody had a pager in high school. I don't know if that was a universal thing based on your face. I'm going to gather no. But in Tucson, Arizona, if you went to high school, you had a pager because even if you had a cell phone, because cell phones had no minutes, like no one had them on and using them. Um, like in the movie, did you watch the movie Clueless? Was that popular? Yeah. Okay. So in the movie Clueless, like they had their phones on all the time and they're walking around with their phones. Like that wasn't a thing. Like we didn't have minutes. Like we kept our phones off because our parents would have killed us if we used our phones. But we had pagers because they were really cheap. And if someone pays you, then you could use your phone or you could go find a payphone when payphones were their thing. And then in college, I had a Palm Pilot and that was very cutting edge because no one had a Palm Pilot. And I really only used it for like scheduling and contacts and like playing games. No, we did not have pages at all. But the minutes I remember, you would call and hang up. Who was your female role model growing up and why? I actually think it was my mom. So she unfortunately passed away last year. And so I, I've gotten to know her as an adult a lot um, over the last couple of years, which is weird. I just actually had this conversation this weekend. You don't think about your parents as people until you get older, which is weird. Like there's this disconnect of not thinking of your parents as actual humans, which is a very strange kind of coming of age moment, I think. But, you know, I learned later in life that she really wasn't very independent at all. And she was actually pretty terrified to step out of her comfort zone. But she did not give me that persona growing up at all. She did not teach me that. So growing up, she challenged me to experience new things, to be my own person, to stand on my own two feet. And this was important to her, never be dependent on a man for financial independence. And interestingly, she taught me to be a feminist, even though her forward of years were the 70s and 70s propaganda taught her that the word feminism was a bad word. So I remember I told her I was a feminist once that she was like, oh my God, you are? But she was a feminist. So that was an interesting kind of unteaching, reteaching moment that we had together. But the point is, she was that. She taught me that. She taught me to be who I am today, even though she wasn't that. But I thank her for that because she really was my role model because she knew she wasn't some of the things she wanted me to be, but she still gave me that structure and that core. So I appreciate that. I'm sorry she heard it. And thank you very much for sharing that with us and sharing her legacy. How do you think where you grew up and the school you went to and the generation you come from influence your education and career choice? I think being part of the generation that knows what it's like to not have the internet and what it's like to have the internet and what it's like to not be able to live without it has definitely shaped my interest in telecommunications and has ultimately helped me get where I am now. I remember the times of getting the endless AOL CDs in the mail. I don't know if that was a thing where you grew up, but oh my God, I feel like every day we got a new AOL CD in the mail, sign up for AOL and get some ungodly number of minutes for free. Um, you know, and then we were there for the first high speed connections. You know, I remember when I was in college, that was my first high speed connection. And that was cool. We were there for the first cell phones with customizable faces. Ooh, I had a Nokia in college and I had like a zebra print face. And that was so cool. There for the first smartphones, the first touch screens and tablets. You know, the, we saw cell phones go from huge to tiny and then back to huge. I have a huge one. And I feel like we've seen all the iterations. Also, we're probably the first generation that really adopted all of it. You know, previous generations, you know, they've seen it all, but they didn't necessarily adopt all of it. So my generation is kind of very uniquely situated that we saw it, we adopted it, we get it versus generations that came after us. They just always had it. Um, I think that's where my interest in telecom probably started. Specifically during law school, I clerked for the FCC during the digital television transition. Um, there was an effort here in the States, I'm sure other countries have done the same thing, to kind of make better use of the spectrum waves. But basically, previously, analog television systems took up wider bands on the spectrum. And in order to compress those and be able to utilize that spectrum better, they did a digital transition so the spectrum bands could essentially be compressed. Um, I was there for that, and I saw firsthand how the decisions were being made, how the public was affected, what steps were being taken to help people who were going to be left out without the public 
broadcast channels after the transition, what solutions were being put in place to prevent that. And it showed me the importance of creating sound policy, taking the public interest into account, you know, and that's really what led me to where I am now. Now, I'm going to read two quotes. The first one, how does the universe expect me to choose a career path at 16? I can't even choose what I want for dinner. Second, Abraham Lincoln said, I quote, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So, Melissa, I want to know the choices behind your career path. Where and what did you study at university? I was an undergrad. In undergrad, I was a psychology major and I got a Bachelor of Arts in psychology. But I started out as a theater major. I was an acting directing major my freshman year. But then I realized that I probably needed to get a real job after school. So I switched to psychology. But what do you do with a psychology degree? And the answer is you go to grad school. So acting, directing major to psychology major to law school. And who and what influenced you to get into law school and become a lawyer? It's weird. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I just always wanted to go to law school. I don't, so my uncle's a lawyer. It's not, it's not. I just always knew if you asked me when I was 12, what do you want to do when you grow up? I mean, besides ballerina, whale trainer, that fell away. That fell away. That only lasted a short period of time. But if you asked me when I was like 12, what do you want to do? I just always knew I wanted to be a lawyer. But I don't have a specific memory of when that was or what influenced it. It just happened. Um, it just was always something I wanted to do. Um, the telecommunications, that's kind of the, the nuanced piece of this. Um, the reason I chose telecommunications. Okay. So I worked in advertising and radio after college, like I said. And while I was at the radio station, I loved, I loved radio. Radio is it probably because I love music so much. One of my favorite medium, I think, as far as communicating. And I was a late night DJ on air. And it was only a couple nights a week, but it was super fun. And when I was planning to go to law school, I thought, well, maybe I could be a radio lawyer. I you know, a 20, 24 year old Melissa thought that was sounded really good. So, you know, so I went to law school and then my interest in radio led me to learning about the FCC and regulatory law. And that is where I found my niche. What's funny is funny is I'm not a radio lawyer at all. I that's what led me to. And as you mentioned, you work at a radio station, DJ, you're a singer, you're then a comedian. But what professional roles have you had before that led you to the current one? So I clerked at the National Association of Broadcasters during law school. I think that's the closest to radio lawyer I ever got. And, and then after law school, I went to go work for the California Public Utilities Commission, which is a state regulatory agency, um, and they handle telecom matters, energy, water, transportation. Um, I'd like to say that's where I grew up because I learned a lot and met a lot of people. Um, and from there, I'm, I was at a law firm, I, and then I went in how. I mean, so that's kind of the, the path. Like, you know, once I finally found my role with the California PUC, everything else kind of fell into place. I moved up the ranks really quickly. So like I said earlier, you know, I started there in a non-legal role. I just needed a job. I, had, I was coming out of law school. I had student loans. I was like, holy moly, I needed a job. And so I started at a risk of hoping analyst you know, in San Francisco, of all places, of all the crazy expensive places to live with a low paying job, that's where I started. Um, but luckily I was, I was smart and I was, um, I rose up the ranks pretty quickly and that's what led to my next job, you know, at a law firm. And I had a lot of clients and I was doing a lot of different telecom work. My clients liked me and I was working hard for them and I was getting results for them. And they saw that I was driven and they saw that I had good relationships with folks in the industry and, uh, clients poached me. And so that was my first in-house job. And then they laid me off from that job, which was a very terrible idea on their part because then that company went on. Um, that that was good news for my current company because I have been with Geolinks for seven years, you know, and this is my time being the first and only lawyer at a company. So I'm pretty good at starting uh, legal divisions. So what does Geolinks do? Le Geolinks, we're a fixed wireless broadband uh, internet service provider. So fixed wireless is essentially microwave technology. So it's point to point wireless. So it's not like mobile wireless. Um, so we don't do cell phones but it acts kind of like invisible wired technology. So a lot like fiber, uh, we can get fiber-like speed, but using fixed wireless radios and receivers, we can beam really, really fast connections from one point to another. And we don't need to build, to build infrastructure. We don't need to underground fiber connections. We don't need to put stuff up on poles. We don't need to trench through beautiful California scenery, for example, to uh, make our connections. So what is your title and what is your main responsibilities? 
So I am general counsel and vice president of government affairs and education. And so I do all things legal um, and I am in charge of all policy and regulatory advocacy on behalf of the company. Um, our work is primarily in California, but we're all in Arizona and Nevada. And how did you end up getting the role? Who you got to work your network. Um, so actually, you got laid off from my last job. I sent out the, the dear friends, I need a job email to my entire network. And I was fortunate that um, who in the industry who I'm friends with, but also, you know, had worked with in a professional capacity, had been legal advising to geolinks and had told them, you guys need someone in house. You guys need your own lawyer. And so the timing had just worked out that she's like, perfect. Really, it was funny. They interviewed me once and was like, oh, you're hired. Sure. What does a typical work day or work week look like for you? So I've become a generalist anymore. So while my background is in telecom and regulatory, that's, I still do a lot of that. And that's my bread and butter. I mean, some days it's all telecom policy and that's all I do. But on other days, it's, I do some employment law. I'm reviewing some site leases. I'm doing a little contract interpretation I'm, or I'm just doing like general problem solving that requires some analytical thinking. Um, some days I'm making spreadsheets to figure out um, numbers make sense to do a deeper dive and like legal review for litigation. Well, my goal ultimately is to keep this out of litigation, but sometimes you gotta, gotta think. Sometimes I'm providing advice on government ground opportunities. Uh, sometimes I'm doing compliance work. It really just kind of depends on the day. And I think that's just the nature of, of in, you are the lawyer. It, they come to you first for any um, legal question. But I do have um, a lot of outside counsel that I call on for specialized review of things because I cannot be an expert on everything. That's just impossible. So, you know, if it's high level stuff, I have gotten to the point where I know a lot of it, but employment law is a really good example. If it's something nuanced, it's not worth the risk to say, I think this, you know, you really need to know what the answer is. Pull, we pull expertise from outside when we need it. And I love the quote, choose a job you love and you would never have to work a day in your life. So Melissa, what do you love about your role? And I, I don't know how much of this is how I've kind of set up my job. This is how. All GC roles are, maybe I've done a good job of, you know, setting up the walls where I need to. Um, but I love that I have so much autonomy in my role. I get to decide it's worth weighing in, for example, on a state or federal proceeding. And because I'm the one drafting whatever we would submit for that. So I'll do the research. I'll look into whatever the state or, the, you know, federal entities put out for comment, for example. And I'll say, I'm fine. I don't need to comment on that. Or else they're missing the mark on this. We need to put something out. You know, I can determine my own priorities and pull in help from other departments as needed. I don't need permission from you. And I, a lot of that is I've built up trust with my team. So they know that I'm, what I'm ever I'm doing is in the best interest of the company. And they're like, cool, go do what you need to do. Um, and they know that I need to tell them something I will. You know, if I need any resources, I'll totally ask for them and you know, it'll be a conversation. But if I need help from outside counsel, it's a question. I just, I've just earned this. I've, I've never abused them. So the results, I'm efficient and effective, and I, I don't need oversight. And I think my fellow executives appreciate that because they can do their job without worrying about what I'm doing and without me taking up their time to kind of, you know, hold my hand through something. So I think that's my favorite part because I know enough, I'm far enough along in my role that, like, I got this. You hired me to do this job. I know how to do this job. Let me do my job. And they, and they let so. I think that's my favorite part, favorite part. And what is the best experience you've had in your current role? Any examples? In my, in my role, a couple of years ago, we, we received a pretty large grant. It was about $88 million over 10 years in Connect America Fund, which was a, um, a grant to deploy broadband um, in California and Nevada. And it was a pretty big deal because it really legitimized us as a company. It also really legitimized, legitimized all the hard work that the team that worked on that had done. It was the, the biggest kind of slam dunk to that point um, in my role. And what would you say is the biggest challenge you've encountered in your role and how did you tackle that? Building off of the success of the Connect America Fund program, the FCC put out a second program that was very similar called the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, um, RDOF. Um, unfortunately, we just had a very different experience. We thought we were in good shape to get similar funding in California, and we were denied it at the state level. Uh, the FCC, I think, prepared to give it to us. And I don't feel like it was our fault. 
I feel like we had done everything we were supposed to do to get, but we still were denied it. And it just was all a big gut punch. Actually, I think that was the biggest challenge ever in my career, let alone in this role. And what do you wish everybody understood about your role? This is funny. So I think this is just being in-house, but also being a lawyer. Um, I'm not a cop, but I'm also not your mom. So a lot of people, especially at the staff level, they're like, oh, Melissa's here. Don't, don't talk about that. Oh, don't, oh, don't tell Melissa that. I'm like, what's happening? Like, I'm not a cop. I'm not going to get you in trouble. And what is the one common myth about your professional field that you want to disapprove? Yeah, I think this goes with the last question. Like, I think people think that lawyers are narcs. Like, I think they think because lawyers just exist in the world, we're going to go get them in trouble somehow just because you're, I don't know, existing in the world. Again, we're not cops. But our job is to try to keep you out of trouble. So companies should tell us things. Our executives should tell us things. Just, you know, be prepared for not potentially liking our answers because we are, as I've said before, the crusher of dreams. And what do you love about working in the tech industry, especially telecom? I love that we're filling a gap. So we're bringing a solution that doesn't exist to places. So we're disrupting the industry, I think, and improving lives. Um, it's a little different because it's broadband and in and of itself, that doesn't feel novel because a lot of people have broadband, right? But not everyone does. So especially in the U.S., and maybe it's because we have such a vast piece of land that people live in. But I mean, there's a lot of people that do not have fast Internet. So our goal is to bring fast Internet to people who don't have it, but also our delivery method is different. We're a disruptor because we don't require fiber. We don't require undergrounding. We don't require aerial distribution. You know, it's a very different way of deploying. Oprah Winfrey said, I quote, think like a queen. A queen is not afraid to fail. Failure is not a stepping stone to greatness. So Melissa, what has by far been your biggest achievement in your career? I have three. So I think for me, becoming a commissioner advisor at the California PUC at 30 was a big achievement for me. It was easy for me to move up because I really wanted to. I set myself up to do that. It was also the kind of thing where after I was an advisor for a couple of years, I was, I don't have anywhere else to go. So now I have to go out. But being an advisor by 30, I think, was a pretty good accomplishment. And it really set me up for the rest of my career trajectory. Um, being a general counsel by 34 was also pretty good. Um, is running my own legal department by 34. And then turning a no into a yes. This was a personal victory for me. Um, probably on the grander scale of things, people would think this was small. But at my previous company, the California PUC had initially proposed to deny a decision that would have been a huge blow for that company. And I was able to advocate well enough that I got them to change their minds. And I turned a no into a yes. And I actually had old colleagues from my law firm call me and I said, did you actually get a no turned into a yes? That never happens. So sadly, I did not have that same luck on the RDOF side. But at least for that particular thing, it was a little pat yourself on the back. What is the biggest factor that's helped you become successful? Do you have any success habits? I feel like I have good judgment. I don't know every law and regulation. That's impossible. I can't rattle them off. I mean, some people have those photographic memories and they remember everything. But I have a good smell test. If something doesn't smell right, I trust my gut on that one. And I'm very honest. I'm not one to fudge facts or stretch truths. You know, there's a lot of room for creativity regarding how you present information in a factual way, but I never fudge anything. So I think good judgment and being truthful. And how do you measure your performance at work? And that depends on the project. Um, some projects are just, you know, check in the box. But others, I measure my performance on whether I feel good defending what I did in front of regulators or our board. For example, you know, comments and policy pieces, if I can say, I wrote this and it's good and here's why. For me, that's peak performance. Or for projects that, that are geared at improving workplace performance, if I can help prove something is or isn't working and help other departments fix a process flow, that for me is a measure of good performance. And with success comes failures. So what is your biggest failure in your career and what did you learn from it? Yeah, we're going back to that California art off thing. I mean, it felt like such a failure. Again, the hardest thing for me is I don't feel like I could have done anything different. I really feel like I did everything I could have thought to do. We did everything we could have thought to do. And it was almost like a predetermined destiny type thing. This was the answer they wanted to get to. There was no working around it. There was no facts I could have presented to change anybody's mind. So the only thing I've learned from it is sometimes that's going to happen and you just have to find a way to move forward. And what is inspiring and motivate you the most in your role and career right now? 
Connectivity, bringing hope to people, bringing a resource to people that don't have it. Um, it's easy to take for granted that you just have internet, right? I mean, you and I are using the internet to connect thousands of miles, which is crazy. It's crazy. I love it, but it's crazy. And there are people who don't even have dial-up speeds. Um, now, I will say those people have chosen to live in places that are far flung, but maybe they, they do that because that's where they're from or, you know, it's an agricultural thing or, you know, whatever. Or maybe they live on a Native American reservation and those areas have historically and traditionally been left behind, at least in the U.S. So for me, connectivity is a form of equity and it's a tool for equality. And I feel like it's so important and it. And it's always been important. And I've always been a member of the you know, side of getting broadband to everybody. You know, I've always been part of the, that advocacy camp, but especially after COVID, people are like, oh, wait, broadband is important. I think, yeah, it has been forever. Very interesting. Let us now jump into the influence of mentor role models, champions, and sponsors. Melissa, do you have a mentor champion or a sponsor today? I've met a lot of people throughout my career that I've turned to for advice. So, you know, I think this kind of goes to my favorites thing. You know, I've never had favorites, but I do have people in my camp. There's a woman named Rochelle Chong. She is the one who got me the job that I am now. She's a former FCC commissioner, a former California PUC commissioner. She knows the telecom space so well. She's just kind of a badass all around, but also super nice and cool. And I feel like she's someone I can always call on if I need help or she's always a friendly face at conferences that I see. So she's a resource I call on a lot. She's a champion for me. Um, my boss, Ryan Adams, he's the president and CEO of my company. He is my champion. I can call on him if I need anything, if I'm struggling with anything, if I just want to complain about something. He's always there for me and we have a really great working relationship. So he's definitely been one for me. And then I have a group of very good friends. And it's interesting because we didn't really come together for this reason, but we are women who have done very well in our careers and are driven and career oriented and also just happen to make more than our husbands. Again, this is not why we became friends, but we just happen to have this in common. And so we can share experiences there and we can kind of talk through career stuff and life stuff from that perspective. And who's the female non-binary or transgender role model you look up to in your field? I think it's Rochelle. And history shows that it's been more common for men having mentors, champions, and sponsors in business than women. So, Melissa, how important do you think it is to have a mentor, champion, or sponsor during one's career? I think it's very important. There's so many times where sometimes you just want another adult in the room, if that makes sense. You're faced with a decision and you're like, I just want an adult in the room to make this decision. And I realize that I am the adult in the room and I don't like it. I want to bounce an idea off of or just give you a gut check or something. You know, maybe you know the answer, but you're like, I just want someone to listen to me and agree with me or not agree with me or something. But I don't want to be the adults. Yeah. You just want just a second opinion. So it's, I think it's important because even, even at the top of your game, even when you know your stuff, it's just nice to have someone to just listen to me for a second. Let us move on to leadership. Adena Friedman, president and CEO of Nasdaq said, I quote, empowering those around you to be heard and valued makes a difference between a leader who simply instructs and one who inspires. And Shirley Sandberg, ex-CEO of Facebook said, I quote, leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that the impact lasts in your absence. Melissa, what does leadership mean to you? I think being able to take input and make a judgment call is really important for leadership. It's not about being right all the time or knowing more than everyone else. Um, I think it's surrounding yourself with smart people and listening to them, knowing when not to listen to them and knowing when to be able to trust your gut uh, and make a decision on all of that. I mean, I think that's the most important part of leadership. So I think taking all the input and making a reasoned decision and moving forward. But I also think it's important to be able to make a decision. That's ultimately, you just gotta execute and you gotta move forward. And what do you consider good versus a bad leader? Someone who wants yes men around them or puts themselves in a silo where they only hear what they want to hear, that's a bad leader. I have an example of someone who used to lead our country, who I won't mention by name. Um, a good leader, I think, is someone who seeks out information, even if it's not what they want to hear, so that they know the full story. It's someone who's not afraid of the no. And who is your favorite female non-binary in trust to tech leader and why? So I keep saying her name, but I think Rochelle Chong is a great example. She has 
reinvented herself and shifted herself throughout her career. So like I said, she's a former FCC commissioner, former CPUC commissioner. And then once her CPUC commissionership ended, she really had to kind of figure out what her next steps were. And she has really done that. She went to go work for the governor's office when Arnold Schwarzenegger was our governor, which is a funny sentence to say, but it happened. And then she has her own practice, but she's also working with the state middle mile project. I mean, she's kind of everywhere, which is amazing. And she should be. And I just think that's a great example of just, you know, someone who I have all this experience. What can I go do with it? And so that's why she's a role model. And how would you describe yourself as a leader? I think I have good judgment. I have a good smell test, like I said. So using that and using my lawyer brain to help identify, you know, what steps and resources I need to figure out, you know, how to follow that smell test, right? If something doesn't smell right, I need to go figure out why. I can break it down into steps to figure out why. But I also, I can make a definitive answer. So even if I don't have all the information, you know, I understand that the business moves fast and sometimes you need an answer before you can do a thorough analysis, right? So even if you don't have the full picture, if it doesn't feel right, I would prefer to say no to something because I don't want to rush into something that may come out back and bite us in the end. I use my judgment and I do the best I can, but if something does not feel right, I believe that because usually I'm right. And as a leader, what values are most important to you? Honesty, integrity, fairness, and respect. I believe in treating people the way you want to be treated, generally not being an asshole. I really don't do well with assholes, so I try not to be one, but also not being a pushover. Um, I am a very nice person, I think, but I am a nice until I am not. But I will say that the not is earned, if that makes sense. You really got to push my buttons to get there. But once you're there, you're there. So what leadership lessons have you learned that form you into the leader you are today? I think it's important to remember your own values when you're leading. Um, if you aren't comfortable with something, you have to voice that. So I find that often people will listen to you if you're not comfortable with something. They may not realize how you feel about something if you're not telling them, right? So if you feel strongly about something, you should present your position factually and assertively. And I have found that people will listen to that. They may not agree with you and they may still do what they want to do. But in leadership, you say, I don't want us to do this and here's why and this is how I feel about it. You need to present that. You need to make that known. And you've mentioned all your strengths and probably weaknesses during the entire interview now, but summarize it. What are your three strengths and three weaknesses? Yes, my three strengths are I'm smart, I'm very good at what I do, and I see through BS. My weaknesses, though, I tend to use humor as a defense mechanism or when I'm nervous, which I think can sometimes make me seem less serious. Sometimes I might come off as kind of goofy. And I look young, which is great for my personal life, but it's hard for my boardroom life, especially being a woman. Looking young is not very helpful. Um, my other weakness is I didn't come up with another weakness. Let us now jump into the hottest topic in business today, which is workplace culture, unlocking the power of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So Melissa, what does diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging mean to you personally? I think it's very important because diversity of people means diversity of ideas and also diversity of viewpoints. And that means innovation and creativity, tapping into new markets, new messaging, et cetera. And I think the narrative has been too stagnant for too long. And if I may speak frankly, too white and too male. And what do you consider three to five signs of good company culture if you were to join a company again? Open flow of ideas. Um, diverse hiring practices, mentoring training programs, opportunities for advancement, and feedback opportunities. And as a woman, what has been the most significant political or culture barrier in your career, and how have you overcome these challenges? So I have found that I have been the only woman at the table in a lot of places in my career. And I don't know what to attribute that to. Sometimes it's just circumstantial, I think. But it is something that I've experienced. So that definitely creates a feeling of otherness, right? And the otherness is sometimes hard to overcome. And between the otherness and the looking young and the humor as a defense mechanism, it kind of makes me feel like this like goofy robot at the table sometimes, which has been something I've worked to overcome in my career. So as I've gotten older, it's better. And I think that goes to that, you know, unapologetic acceptance that I've worked on. But you kind of get to the point where it's like, okay, whatever, I'm a girl, like get over it. Like I'm sitting at the table, it's fine. 
but it's hard when you're climbing the ranks. And I recently was at an event where I spoke to two very young women in their career. I mean, it was like a first year and a third year law student. So these were baby lawyers who were starting out. And I had to learn to take up space. And so my advice to them was take up the space. You're smart. They hired you for a reason. Know that you're smart and know that you're here to do what you're here to do. So I just needed to say, do, you know, speak up for myself and realize that I was in the role for a reason. So I'm still working on it, but I'm trying to own it. Just got to own it. And what do you think is important for more women, women of color, non-binary and transgender to join the tech industry today beyond what you said that it brings diverse ideas? I think representation is important. And I know that's been at the forefront of a lot of conversations in a lot of spaces, um, not just in the tech industry. But I do think it's important if you see more people like you in a field, you're probably more likely to realize it's okay to act like you, think like you, feel like you, be like you, right? So you see something you don't like, you can say something without fear of retribution because others probably feel the same way. Or at least you can take comfort in thinking maybe that's the case. And do you and how do you speak with your colleague, peers, and community about the IB challenges, for example, salary gaps and promotions, et cetera? For me, I think I probably lean more on my friend group that I was mentioning because we are similarly situated in that way. I mean, we talk about these kind of things. We talk about strategies for I want to ask for a raise. How should I do it? I want to ask for a promotion. How should I do it? You know, here's an email I drafted asking for how does this look? We definitely lean on each other for that. And we talk about asking for what we deserve. I mean, I'm definitely guilty of not demanding what I'm worth. I fear that that is a universal among women in the professional field. I would love that to be an incorrect statement. So if I am wrong, fantastic. But I fear that I am not wrong. So I'm a work in progress. I think we all are, but I'm trying to recognize that. But you have to have those discussions with people to realize when you're worth more and when to ask for more and how to get better about it. So no one is just going to hand you something. So you got to work on that. But also you need to be prepared for the no. And if you get the no, what are you going to do about it? But great advice to be able to support each other because that's what a lot of men do. So it's great that women also can do that because that's what we exactly need. And there are many public and internal discussions about the barriers women, women of color, non-binary and transgenders face for reaching high position in the tech industry or receiving even funding. How do you feel has the effect that is affecting you? And what is your advice on how to best unblock these roadblocks? I think having a conversation is the first step. If you ignore the problems and the hope it'll fix itself or, you know, think, oh, it's not a problem, it's fine, then it's just always going to be a problem. So I think having these conversations has helped me and probably other people because it's helped people around me realize it's a problem. It's changed how they talk about things. It's changed how they act. Even if they don't realize, even if it's a subconscious change, it changes just how people say things. Just something simple as phrasing. And if they even make the subtlest change, that rubs off on other people in their lives, right? It rubs off on their kids. It rubs off on their spouses. It rubs off on their subordinates at work. And so it all trickled down. And while I don't believe in trickle down economics, I believe in this kind of trickling down. And today, tech companies spend a lot of marketing money to attract women, women of color, non-binary and transgenders. However, at the same time, they're finding it hard to retain them. Articles show that women are leaving the tech industry. What is your best advice on strategies for how companies can work to build a stronger corporate culture that engages the IB? It's not just internal company policy. It's great that you're hiring them. But then once you have women working for you, you have to realize that you have to retain them. Like, it's great. Get them in the door. But it has to be a welcoming industry and it has to be a workplace that's sustainable for their lives, right? I love this question. So with respect to the industry, I have a great example. So there is a conference, and I will not mention the conference, but there's a conference that I've been to several years going, and I made the decision this year that it is not worth my time to go anymore because it is a good old boys club and it sucks and I don't have the energy to fix it or overcome it or whatever, and I don't want to go anymore. Because I go and the men there look at me like I have two heads and I'm like, what is happening? I've been at this conference like four years in a row. You've seen me before. I just asked you if someone is sitting in this chair. Like it doesn't make any sense. And it's not worth it. I don't have time for that. So if this industry wants to retain women, that's one thing that needs to change is that conference needs to suck less because otherwise women aren't going to go. You know, there need to be more diversity efforts within the industry broadly, not just within your company. But also, it is no secret that women are still finding 
that the brunt of domestic life falls on them. Even if a woman is the primary breadwinner in the family, I'm not trying to make generalizations, but facts are facts, right? That is generally what we're finding. And so if that's what you are finding and you're finding that women are leaving because they need a job that's part time because they have to take their kids to whatever they have to, you know, whatever the case may be for that individual. Um, I think I'm talking about women. I'm not trying to just talk about women, but I'm using that as an example, probably because I am a woman. But if that's the case, you know, come up with a flexible schedule, come up with some child care on site. Maybe come up with some kind of elder care help situation that you can come up with. Domestic assistance services, whatever. Do some fact gathering to find out what services or whatever would help the people that you're hiring stay in the position. So if you want more women to stay with you, then figure out what you need to do to make them stay with you. What would you say are the few factors of challenges of implementing a DIB culture in a workplace and in the tech industry today? So change is hard and people are resistant to it. Also, I don't know if you're saying this, but at least in the States, there's a movement against it, which is super gross. Yeah, that's a whole thing. People are dumb. Diversity and inclusion is the latest thing to be vilified in the States. Not everywhere. Yeah, I hate it here. Anyway, these efforts cost money that affect bottom lines and investors have trouble with that because investors, they're not coming in and giving money because they are doing it for altruistic reasons, right? So they need to see how diversity and inclusion type programs are going to help increase productivity, for example, how it's going to help drive revenue. They need to see the bottom line. I think it's important to see how it can be pitched to something that will bring in money or help in some other untangible way that will eventually bring in money and not just something that's the, quote, right thing to do. I hate saying that, right? Because it's gross, but it is what it is. And I think that that would be the most effective way to get diversity and inclusion programs implemented in the quickest way possible. Why and how do you think companies would benefit from not just having women, women of color, non-binary and transgender leaders, but actual higher gender representation at C-suite level and boardrooms with actual voice? So same as I said earlier, diversity of ideas, right? I don't think it's a secret that people of different genders, life experiences think differently. And also there are strange competitive forces that take over when there's too much of one gender over another in a room. It's weird. But more balance creates a more balanced exchange of ideas. And I think that that's an important thing to realize. And I think that just creates a better exchange that's going to lead to a more productive conversation. So if that's the truth... What would you say is the biggest reason behind that we don't have more women, women of color, non-binary and transgender leaders in the tech leadership roles and as startup founders still today? Well, let me start by saying the patriarchy is alive and well. So there's that. But change is slow. And generational wealth and privilege tends to sit with white men. And also traditionally, there are more men in positions of power. Older men tend to be at the executive level. And as we discussed, women can also leave the workforce or make changes driven by domestic duties, and this leaves men at the table at a higher rate. You know, there's a lot of factors, but at the end of the day, the executive levels who tend to be older, I mean, they're just more men left. So we have to find a way to break the barriers and create paths for others to either catch up or leapfrog, which is a very unpopular concept for the fragile white men in the world who don't like that their position of power is being uprooted. Um, speaking very freely, but that's what's happening. And data reveals a concerning trend of low funding rates for startups led by women, with only 1-2% to 2 for funding directed towards women in the tech industry. Black and Latino women in particular receive less than 1%. What factors do you believe contribute to this imbalance and what strategies can be achieved to increase funding for women-led startups? Especially for these funding and, you know, investing and VCs and et cetera. I mean, it tends to be a good old boys club because they know more people with money. And unfortunately, people tend to believe men more. There's a ton of studies on this. I don't have any that I can quote. So people may reach out to me and say, you're full of it. Fine. But it's true. Um, so, you know, there's this kind of, oh, this guy knows his stuff. Let's give him money. So I think we need to have programs that are specifically for women and minority owned businesses only for them. And I'm not trying to discriminate against any other kind of business, but there are opportunities that already exist for those businesses. And there are fewer opportunities that are solely for women and minority-owned businesses. 
So we need people who are only focused on giving to those businesses. Um, we need people that give those them a chance. And then there has to be some kind of shift. And then once there are more, I feel like the change will pop up. And how much do you think the tech industry has changed regarding the IB since you joined? That is a wonderful question. I thought about this. And the answer is, I don't know. I want to think it has changed a lot, but I don't know if it has changed as much as I hope it has changed. That's my honest answer. And looking back on your career, what one thing would you have changed in your working environment to break the bias? I don't feel like I've done very much in my professional life with respect to this. And I'm not going to make excuses for that. I do think that I've never actually been in a management position in my career, which is kind of weird considering where I am. Um, it just kind of never happened. So I don't know how much of that is because of that. But I will say that there probably has been opportunity for me to do more and maybe I didn't recognize it. So my pledge to all of your listeners is that I will do better. But in my personal life, I will say that I have been more involved on this level. So um, I was the president of the San Diego Women's March and I was active in that organization for a couple of years. So I've worked on these kinds of issues. I just have not done enough in my professional life. So looking forward, what will you do? Yes, looking forward in my pledge to do better. Yes. So we're trying to actively recruit, hire, and promote on a diverse basis. Um, trying to set hiring quotas, and develop mentoring programs, and definitely ensure equal pay structures. Amazing. I look forward to that. Let us move on to another hot topic in business today, which is work-life balance and mental health. Melissa, you have without a doubt a busy lifestyle. How do you take care of yourself to maintain good mental health? I don't have children, so I think that helps me. Um, nothing against people who have children. That's a great personal choice. That's not one that I've made. So I honestly am not sure how people with kids balance everything. So kudos to them. I try to prioritize exercise and downtime. Um, ever since starting to work at home, I set boundaries of, you know, I clock in at this time, I clock out at this time. And if there's a project going on and I'm needed after hours, of course, like that's the job. But I don't check email just to check email. I don't do work to just do work, if that makes sense. So if it's pressing, of course, if I'm needed, of course, you know, if I'm on vacation and someone needs me for something, no big deal. But otherwise, I try to set those healthy boundaries as much as I can. Have you ever experienced burnout? Oh, my God, 100%. When I worked at the law firm I worked at, there was no balance. That was not a thing. And I think many people who work at a law firm have had the same experience or are having the same experience. So the best advice I can give besides setting your boundaries, if you are able to do that, but try really hard to do that, is take your vacation days. I know a lot of people don't. I was one of them. When I worked at the firm, I didn't take time off, which was foolish. But if you get vacation days, use them, prep for them, get your stuff done, you know, and then take your time. And uh, my best friend has a saying, you know, about taking time out. She's like, we're not saving lives. She's like, things can wait till we get back. And so, I mean, obviously that analysis is different if you're actually saving lives in your job. But I, as a lawyer for an internet company, am not. And then what is your advice on how companies can create a more mentally healthy workplace in a new now? I would say encourage your team to take their vacation days. Encourage physical activity in a healthy workplace. You know, I know a lot of workplaces have like step challenges and things like that. I think those are good. Um, invest in healthcare. My company has a free option for healthcare, which I think is important. And I know that's rare. They really invest in that, which I appreciate. Um, encourage breaks and team building and then support actual mental health, like behavioral health coverage, time off for medical appointments, things like that. What motivates you every day to get out of bed? Also, I have two dogs and one is very old. And if he gets up, I got to get up because I don't want to clean my carpet. But that's not what you're asking. So for me, living my life motivates me. Um, I have worked hard to get where I'm at and where I am, not just professionally, but in my life. I'm who I want to be with. I'm living the life I wanted. I'm very fortunate that I live in the place I want to live. I really like my house. My husband and I bought a new house about a year and a half ago, and I really like it. Um, while there's always room for improvement, I feel like I've got the big stuff in place, which really makes it much easier to get up and say, okay, let's start the day because I like my environment. So even if there's challenges, I got that going for me. So now let us wrap up with a few words of wisdom and a piece of advice for our listeners. Melissa, what is the best piece of advice you've been given that has helped you during setbacks in your role and career? Again, I don't do favorites, right? So I don't have like bests and worsts and anything. Um, but I will say that advice from my friend 
that we're not saving lives. I think that that is really strong advice for when you're setting boundaries. I have told my boss this because he has trouble setting those boundaries because he is so dedicated to his job. And I said, Ryan, we're not saving lives. Just go take a day off. I think that that's good advice. I think, again, if you're saving lives, please make a different analysis. But I think that's a good thing to keep in the back of your head because it is just work. And if you are more important than that. And so obviously, if you have something going on and you you know need to dedicate yourself to a project, do what you got to do. But don't let that overtake you. And then what is the worst advice you've been given and how did you tackle that? It's not one piece of advice, but I think I learned the term gaslighting too late to have realized all the gaslighting that I had been subjected to prior to learning. But I have been gaslit by former bosses. And I just remember I mentioned needing like dental work and they were like, oh, you don't need that. It was like, these are not the droids you're looking for. And I'm like, I, well, I do need that. And really it was just, no, you should stay here and work all the time. Anyway, so just be aware of gaslighting. If something just sounds weird, it's probably weird. And is there something you wish you would have known or a skill you wish you had when starting out in the tech industry? Well, I think the gaslighting thing is a good one, um, but that's just generally in jobs and life. Don't let anybody fool you. If it sounds like BS, it's probably BS. It's also, especially as a woman or probably someone who falls within one of the diverse categories, you know, a person of color or a transgender person, someone who is not kind of the stereotypical cisgendered white male, right? Um, you know, take up the space. You're there because you earned your space there. Own it. You know, don't let anybody tell you that you don't deserve to be there or that you're not smart or that you're not whatever you are because you are. And if you had the ability to go back in time to when you were just at the beginning of your career, what advice will you give to younger self? One piece of advice I tell young law school students, um, law school hopefuls before they go to law school. As I tell them to go to the highest ranked law school they can, um, when I was applying for schools, I was 20 something year old. Melissa, I look back and I'm like, how do you not know things? I didn't know nothing. I don't think any of us did, but that's the point. I knew nothing about anything. Um, so I would tell law school fools that they should go to the highest ranked school they can get into because I was clueless. And while I wouldn't change anything about my actual career path, which seems very counterintuitive in me telling the story, but I would tell my younger self to go to a higher ranked law school. Oh, and also I would tell the law firm, Melissa, how to bill more efficiently because I was too nice and I didn't bill for a lot of the work I actually did because I didn't think about it. You know, it's fine. My clients liked me probably because I wasn't billing them enough. And what advice would you give to young girls, women, women of color, non-binary and transgenders who want and trying to break into STEM fields today, especially wanting to become next generation leaders? I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, but take up space. Voice your opinions. Don't shrink away from challenges or shy away just because the cisgendered white men are louder. They are so loud and they have been taught to be loud and they have been praised for being loud and told that they are very, very special their entire lives. That's not all their fault, I will say. It's cultural and generational. But you are special too and you are smart and you deserve to be where you are and you you know got the job because of who you are and what you've done and so don't let anybody tell you differently sit at the big table you know you walk into a conference room and there's seats at the big table or seats around the room don't sit just around the room because you think you should sit at the big table and you told me that what motivates you every day is what you have built so far and you have come very far in everything around you. So last but not least, what is next for you in your role and career in tech, Melissa? What are your career aspirations? I'm not going to lie. If I could figure out a way to retire early, I totally would. I would just garden and, I don't know, do arts and crafts and play with my dogs. But if I got to work, then I think, you know, taking my company to the next level and seeing what we could do together to continue our work to uh, connect the unconnected. Amazing. I look forward to follow that because it sounds so cool. Thank you very much, Melissa, for being a guest on the Queens of Tech podcast, sharing a journey with without a doubt inspire change and reshape company culture for the next generation of women, women of color, non-binary and transgender leaders in tech. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. If you have worked in the tech industry a minimum of three years and would like to share your journey, 
please nominate yourself or somebody you know to i at jasminemorati.com. For more podcast episodes and to learn more about the Queens of Tech initiative and to support us, visit queensof.tech.